pleasant good afternoon. Welcome all. We've been waiting with so much anticipation this week because we know that we have a lot of people who are logged in. We want to shout out a lot of schools that have sent in pre-registration. So right at this time, we want to shout out you, Eleuthera. We want to shout out you, Long Island, and of course, the great Grand Bahama. Thank you so much, young men and leaders that have taken this time to encourage themselves, empower themselves, and of course, transform their lives. It is my job right here to welcome you to the second annual UB Men Conclave. This is a private meeting, but because of our times, that is COVID-19, as well as the school system, we're gonna make this open so any young man that needs to see this can see this. We wanna give special thanks to our sponsors this evening, which is of course the University of the Bahamas, UB Mingo's Athletics Department, our many alumni that have given their time to assist in this presentation, and of course, where I stand right now, the Balmoral Club. Without further ado, I'm gonna introduce the late Terrace Bethel, Bethel, who is one of our alumni, and he was a previous COPUS president, who's gonna introduce the significance of this day and help you better understand what is International Men's Day. Do enjoy this presentation. Good afternoon, good morning. I've been here so long, I thought it was the afternoon. So, as you said, I used to go here and I was also the president of COBUS. And um, as a record to the time that I was here as president, you see those signs on the step that say, keep the steps clear at all times. The, what we used to do is we used to sit on those steps. <laughs> and so, uh, we got run off of those many times. Let's uh, get right into International Men's Day. So International Men's Day was started um, by a gentleman in Trinidad and Tobago. And his idea was to use his father's birthday to recognize all the achievements and the contribution that men make to society. When we started to look at bringing equal um, rights to women, we started to realize that somewhere along the way, we've done something wrong. We've ignored the rights and challenges of men. So in the Bahamas, International Men's Day was um, recognized first two years ago. Myself and Keith Cox, we were challenged with the idea of bringing International Men's Day to the Bahamas. And so we celebrated it with a uh, march and with a symposium. And shortly after that, we started the men's program at the Ministry of Social Services and the director is Mr. Henry Johnson. So Henry Johnson came in um, shortly after our group started and what he wants to do is he wants to do something very simple is get a group of the organizations working with men and boys in the country and then we could begin to deal with some of the issues that we want to deal with with International Men's Day. And here's what International Men's Day in the Bahamas is to bring together men across the country to focus on critical issues affecting men. In the Bahamas, the focus is issues related to the high death rate from homicide and violence amongst young men and boys. And the high rates of incarceration of men and boys and the deficits in education. If you people here now are in grade 11 and 12, 10, 11, and 12, one of the things you would notice is that the girls are now outperforming the boys, but when, high, when you were in primary school and junior high, not so much. There's something wrong. There's nothing that naturally makes women more gifted academically than men. Something is wrong. If you come to this university, there are twice as many, three, well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Everybody could have two and have one to spare. <laughs> so that really is a problem because guess what? Those women need men to marry. So our job, International Men's Day, is going to try to get all of the men in this country, men's organizations, to focus on boys and the needs of boys 
so that you become strong men that raise good children. The International Men's Day Committee has some more objectives beyond the ones that we have chosen to focus on the Bahamas. And those objectives are to focus on the health of men and boys, improving gender relations, that's relationships between men and women, promoting gender equality, and when people hear me promote gender equality, they wonder what I'm talking about. Do you know men have less access to children when they're not married to the mother under the law? The law does not allow men, even if the mother is an unfit mother, the father has a difficulty under the law. The other thing is men can't adopt children as easily as women can in the country, okay? We also want to highlight male role models. Um, we also want to highlight the discrimination against men and boys and do what we can to correct that, and also celebrate the achievement and contributions to the community, family, marriage, and child care that men make on a regular basis. International Men's Day is held on the 19th of November every year. That's the only date you gotta remember. You get that right in any history exam. We give you five points, okay? Thank you very much. Good evening, Bahamas, and welcome to the first of a series of the UB Men's Conference. My name is Denavio Neely, our senior currently completing a bachelor's degree in secondary education biology with a minor in French, and it is my distinct pleasure to serve as your host for this conclave. Derek W. Smith is the Compliance Officer and MLRO for CG Atlantic's Group Family of Companies, member of Coral Isle Group Limited in the Bahamas and Turks and Caicos. This top 40 under 40 leader is regarded as a senior contributor in the Bahamas, compliance and anti-money laundering space where he facilitates training in the areas of business continuity management information security governance, organizational resilience, and agility. Derek is a governance, risk, and compliance professional for more than 20 years with a record of leadership, innovation, and mentorship. Derek is a past group compliance officer and MLRO at a Tarolex member law firm, past assistant vice president of fiduciary risk, past Assistant Vice President of Compliance and Past Assistant Manager of Internal Audit at a Wolfsburg Group Member Bank and a Past Auditor at a Big Four Accounting Firm. He is also a holder of the Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialist. Derek is a frequent business columnist and has published more than 30 articles to date. Additionally, in 2020, he represented the Compliance Commission of the Bahamas at the Financial Action Task Force International Cooperation Review Group of America's on-site visit to the Bahamas. Derek is an executive of the Bahamas Association of Compliance Officers and member of ACAM's Bahamas chapter. Moreover, Derek is a nonprofit leader. He is a member and past executive of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, past president of the Nassau Bahamas Panhellenic Council, and past executive advisor and center manager with the Junior Achievement Bahamas Program. He is currently the 2020 through 2022 Rotary Means Business Chair of Rotary District 7020 a district covering 10 Caribbean countries. Derek is a frequent business columnist on governance, risk compliance, anti-money laundering, and information security topics, and once again, having written and published more than 30 articles to date. He is married to Lashanta Smith, Nay Gibson, and the union has four children. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker, Mr. Derek W. Smith. 
no pressure at all after that introduction. Uh, let me just say I appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak today on something that's very, very important to me. It's called a man in me. And the reason why I decided to choose the man in me is because I feel that a lot of men today seem not to have the direction that's needed or some false views on what a real man is. Um, unfortunately, persons feel that real men don't make mistakes. That is incorrect. Unfortun unfortunately, persons feel that real men must always be the only provider for a family. That is a mistake. Unfortunately, persons feel that you are not a real man when you are able to articulate truly your beliefs. Unfortunately, people feel you are not a real man if you have the ability to be well-dressed. Unfortunately, people feel that you are not a real man if you are scholarly. Unfortunately, society thinks that you are not a real man if for some reason you allow another male or female to disrespect me by. With that being said, let's talk about the M. And the M is the mindset. Your mindset is a collection of thoughts and beliefs that shape your thoughts and habits. Your mindset is a collection of beliefs that shape your thoughts and your habits. Have you ever heard that persons sometimes use the cliche, consistency is key? Let's think about that. Why do persons say consistency is key? Or better yet, my fitness coach, he might disown me based on the belly that's coming once in a while. My fitness coach, Donovan J. Rule, always says to me, Derek, get your mind right. So if you're getting your mind right and you appreciate that consistency is key, I would posit the view that you should consistently get your mind right to ensure that you have the right keys to be successful as a real man. You know, we can move and we can talk about it scientifically and person can say, that person, there are certain parts of the brain that are emotional that allow you to yak automatically to something. There are other parts of the brain that, are, that control logic. So what I would suggest to a young man is before you respond or you react, train consistently your mind to pause, which allows the logical part of your brain to catch up with the emotional part of your brain that moves at a more rapid pace. Consider options available to you and then respond. I intentionally didn't use react. The attitude or the A within my man and me is for attitude. Please believe that excellence is not a skill. Let me say that again. Excellence is not a skill. Excellence is an attitude. Let me, let me give you a story. I knew this, this, this guy who grew up in a, in a city area. Um, the circumstances were that his father left when he was two, 
got remarried by the time he was seven. Mother got remarried when he was five. Mother left, went to the island, followed her dreams with a new husband for a particular period of time, but always loved him. Dad would drop to school. Dad would try his best to be a part of it, but Dad was really finances for the most part. Okay? Before the age of 12, this boy would have seen friends who were living with him within the community, community be shot. This was the era of the gun dogs and the Hoyas and the Raiders, you know, where persons would, you know, take their 300Z and drive around and as they bank the curve for the court, you know, bust a couple of shots. And politely followed after that, the police. You know, the same young man was exposed equally to the opportunity for an education by his father to St. John's College. It depends on which time or what time you see this man who I knew would determine how you consider him. You know, the reality is the world takes certain looks at you based on what they assume you are. So what this man had to develop was an attitude that no matter in which form he was in, he would be the same person. He was the same person in St. John's. He was the same person on the court in Russia. He was the same person when his head got slapped off because he didn't listen to his mommy and his daddy and told him not to take the bone box to school. He was the same person that got his head tore off when he was on the, on the bus because he bought the Oakleys and he should not have had them from a boy on the court. You know, this was the same guy who bought his first 33 before he was 15. He had to choose the attitude he was going to have in life. And now the same boy is the man who speaks before you. Excellence is not a skill. Excellence is an attitude. The last point in my man in me is that it is nurture over nature. Through the opportunities I've had by various mentors to be an advisor in the Junior Achievement Program for some 15 years. I've had the opportunity to see persons from all walks of life, all circumstances, all try to, to vie for awards, most distinguished achiever, most distinguished officer, above and beyond the call of duty. And for every scenario that was provided, irrespective of the nature, irrespective of the drunken father, irrespective of the absent mother or father, irrespective even of circumstances of molestation. They, a lot of these students, achievers, allowed their nurturing environment of the Junior Achievement Program to help them overcome their nature. The biological aspects of what they were encountering due to their genealogy, due to their family. I solemnly believe that there's nature and there's nurture and with the right nurturing environment, hands down, you can produce a successful man. To the young men of all ages, I would like to remind you that it's your mindset, it's your attitude, and it's nurture over nature.
Ahmad Rashad Thompson is a person of value who values people and adds value to them. Placed on earth to help you become a better version of yourself, everything Ahmad undertakes is directed at fulfilling this purpose. Every speech he writes is directed at fulfilling this purpose. Every speech he writes, every presentation he gives, every contract he accepts is meant to inspire those around him to become world changers. Ahmad holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from the then College of the Bahamas, now University of the Bahamas, is an international professional in human resources, a certified strategic human resource leader, certified in employment law, and human resource for practitioner, a John Maxwell certified coach, speaker, teacher, and trainer, and he believes in every single one of you has something this world needs to experience. Ahmad says that inaction is the enemy of progress and your comfort zone is the graveyard of all ambition. Please help me welcome our next conclave speaker for this evening, Mr. Ahmad Rashad Thompson. I believe, gentlemen, ladies in the audience, that I am a person of value that values people and adds value to them. And tonight I'm talking to you as, I, as we celebrate International Men's Day on the topic of, of course, there's an I in leadership. Now, if you know how to spell, you can know that phonetically there is no I in the word leadership. But I'm going to talk to you about three very important words that begin with the letter I that you need to embody as you become and, and embrace your manhood. I want to ask you, what does it take to be a good leader? What does it take to create good leadership, to have sound leadership skills and leadership abilities? One of the things that you determine, that you use to determine how you select a leader to follow is how well you like this person, how much this person is going to resonate with you, and how much of their story you can relate to. The first I I want to talk about tonight is influence. Gentlemen, you can't do anything in life unless you have influence. Influence is more than being able to woo somebody or wow somebody into doing something for you. Influence is having someone do something because, not just because you said so, but because you changed their mind in doing so. My colleague talked about mindset. And influence is more than just, like I said, having the ability to get something done or having somebody to do something for you. It's actually changing their mind about what they already thought was the right thing to do. If you think about the things, the relationships that you have right now and the people that you are able to influence, you want to know how strong you are and how good you are as a leader. Consider when you say something to them, how quickly they move, how much intent they move with, and how much of what you said to do, they actually get done. Anyone, any great leader that you can think of is great because of his or her influence. It's because of what they say and how they say it and how they get people to move after they would have spoken. One of the people that I can think of that is influential is Jesus. He's my best friend. I love him dearly. And I keep, I, I come to the story of the, of the fisherman comes to, comes to mind when he said to them to push the boat out and cast your net, right? These gentlemen were avid and expert fishermen. They knew what it meant and what it, what it took to be good and sound fishermen. When Jesus told them to push the boat out and put their net on the side, on the left, on the next side of the boat, these men were probably thinking, wait, what? Like, you don't fish in the daytime, you fish in the nighttime, you fish in the shallow, you don't fish in the deep. Who does they think he is? But something about what he said and how he said it made them say, you know what? I can push, I can push the boat out. I can, I can go out in the deep. I'm going to cast this net on the side he's asking me to cast it on and see what happens next. That is influence. Influence is not to be confused or mistaken for intimidation. Cowards intimidate. Leaders influence. The next I I want to talk about is innovation. Gentlemen, ladies in the audience, you have to realize that you cannot do what you've always done expecting to go where you've never been. You can be in the field with someone that's doing the very same thing as you, but unless you are doing it innovatively, thinking about the best way to get this thing done, you will perish. Innovation is more than just the brightest new idea or the fastest new idea. 
It's actually trying to understand how do I take what I do right now and make it better than anybody else that's doing it with me? How do I set myself aside from my competition and from those that are trying to be like me or that I'm trying to be like? In the field that I'm in, I'm in the human resources field and I focus on training and development and organizational growth and development, a very saturated field globally and becoming a saturated field in the country. But you have to determine in yourself what is going to be the factor that, dis that separates me from anybody else doing what I'm doing right now. That has the aspiration to do what I'm doing or that I have the aspiration to do myself. Innovation is doing it like nobody's ever seen it before. It's like, wow, when I think of this, I have to call this. Because he or she does it in a way that nobody ever has before. Think of a telephone company. Let's use Apple, for example. Right? They do, somebody's looking at me very side eye, and I'm sorry that you feel offended, but that's just what the example I'm going to go with. Okay? I am an Apple fan. I believe, I was once a Samsung fan or Android fan. I was really, really against Apple and really, really pro-Android. But I consider myself, what's the word I want to use? Unique, extra, different, not standard. And to me, when I became an Apple fanatic or an Apple fan, I realized that their image matched my image. They do things that have never been done before. Argue all you want, that's what I believe. They do things that have never been done before, and they do it in a way that makes other people want to copy what they've done. I read a book today, an excerpt from a book today, that talked about Michelangelo and the fact that he was um, charged to paint, to do something in, in, by, in the Vatican by the Pope at the time, Pope Julius at the time. And his original invitation was to do something other than the painting he did on the roof. But when he did that, it caused any other striving artist, aspiring artist, functioning artists in that time to do their work differently. He was the most innovative artist of his time, potentially of this time as well. When you think of how innovative you are, you have to understand that what you're doing has to be something that nobody's ever seen before and will definitely take what you're doing to the next level. The third and final I, I want to focus on tonight is impact. The word impact is synonymous with the, the feeling you give somebody as you leave their presence or as you come into their presence. I believe that my impact on people is that I change their minds. I am a world changer. I intentionally do things that are going to make you think and question, is what I'm doing the best thing that I could possibly do? When you think of the word impact, I want you to ask yourself the question. When you leave a room, when you leave somebody's presence, when you leave somebody's um, presence, as I just mentioned, what effect do you want to have on them? What is the lasting impression you want to leave? Leaders understand that impact is not necessarily always going to be positive. It should be life-changing. It should be mindset-shifting. When you think of what it means to be a man and a leader, leaders realize that their impact should be a value, it should be positive, and it should be lasting. You have to ask yourself the question, what do I want the world to think of me, to see of me, once I've left it? What is my legacy going to be? What am I leaving the world behind when I go? When I leave a stage, when I leave a podium, what do I want to leave you with? What impact do I want to have on someone? That is how you determine how excellently you do what you are called to do. Every one of us, every one of us on this call, in your world, in your life, right now has the ability to leave an impact. You have to determine what you want your impact to be, how severe you want it to be, and how positive you want it to be. That's going to require ingenuity, that's going to require intentionality, and it's going to, have, it's going to require overt focus. You cannot do what you've, ne what you've always done and expect to go where you've never been. Impact is more than just a feeling. Because I can make you feel good, I can, make you I can make it feel really good, but what have I caused you to think differently about? True leaders instill a level of new thinking in the people that they have, a, uh, have the privilege of leading. Leaders have to ask themselves the question, why do people follow me? Why do people not follow me? Think of your worst characteristic and ask someone, what is the impact of that particular characteristic? When this shows up in my life with you, how does it, what impact does it have on you? How well do you think of me after I leave your space because of that particular characteristic? Every one of us has flaws. Every one of us has, mo every one of us 
has moments of opportunity. Those areas of opportunity that present themselves are your finest chance to get better, to develop that innovative spirit that you are born with. There is no one on this planet that is able to do and have the impact that you are called to have. No one, nowhere, under no circumstance. Every one of you was born with something in you that this world deserves to and needs to experience. How do you do it? By building and creating and fostering your influence. Getting people to change their mind by way of what you've said, by way of what you've did, by, by way of what you've done, sorry, and how you did it and how you said it. The next thing is innovation. Do not do what somebody else is doing. Do it, but do it with your spin, with your stamp, and with your difference in it. And impact. What impact do you want to leave on this world? As you think about that, think about who you are right now. Is who you are today who you want to be when you leave this earth? Every day you are given 86,400 seconds. Every single day, it's science. It happens whether you are alive or not. 86,400 seconds you are given every day you wake up. I ask you, if the last 86,400 seconds you had to find your legacy, what would that legacy be? How influential would you have been? How innovative would you have been? What sort of impact would you have had? As you become a man, as you embrace your manhood, and you decide what you want to be in this life, always remember that there is always an I in leadership. Thank you for your time, gentlemen and ladies, if you're in the audience. God bless you. Good evening. Renward G. Mortimer II is a graduate of the College of the Bahamas, now University of the Bahamas, with an Associate of Arts in Psychology and a Bachelor in Psychology with a concentration in Industrial Organizational Psychology. Renward Mortimer II is a creative leader. He continues mentoring emerging artists, helping them to use their God-given talents to elevate others. He has been an inspirational speaker for over 10 years, speaking to thousands of young people in the Bahamas and the United States of America, and is an author. With over a decade in artistry, he has illustrated in numerous projects, most noteworthy, his own publishing his book, How to Tame the Beast, and hosting workshops throughout the Bahamian Islands on abstinence and waiting for marriage. He is also noted for speaking, continuing volunteering through New Providence, speaking at PACE for over 10 years, and being involved with an international project and publishing by Dr. Aeneas, International Ambassador, on the 100 Greatest Black Leaders of All Time. He is the Chief Graphic Designer for Renber G. Mortimer II, Wayne Head Productions, a marketing concept design and animation company recently contracted to brand the University of the Bahamas athletic department, Mingos designed its logo, 3D mascot, and other graphic illustrations. He has completed many illustrations and digital graphic services, but mostly he is known for Wayne's, his whimsical caricatures completed at weddings, parties, and other celebrations and digital caricatures. He is the only Caribbean and Bahamian registered under the International Society of Caricature Artists and continues to compete against artists that are the best in the world in this form of exaggerated feature caricature being featured in the Society website and publishings as world's fastest artist in 2017. Uh, coming now is our next conclave speaker, Mr. Renberg G. Mortimer II. I now have the pleasure of presenting. My name is Renbert Monomor, and I am the Public Relations and Brand Specialist at the University of the Bahamas. This title is one that has been earned through hard work, but through this presentation, I hope you can understand how this was a part of the process. You see, this was not easy. There's a brand that's at the University of the Bahamas known as Mingos, and this presentation helps you understand why it hit whom so well. 
You see, depression and me are friends. I have felt her hug. I have felt her warmth. She has spoken to my ears, and she is so convincing. At the age of 22, I would meet her, but she would sneak in before that day. Two days before my birthday, there was an incident that transpired. An incident that would change my life and make me question everything that I thought was important. You see, after this incident, I had two degrees and I thought I could always have a job, yet I stood on shelves lying shaking thinking they won't hire me. It destroyed my confidence. I had been experienced, already drawing in society, having $20,000 saved up thinking, oh, I'm going to be something great one day. But because of the incident, once again, my bank accounts were at zero. You see, I found a good friend, and her name was Alcohol. And as I found her, she comforted me, and I thought to myself, oh, aren't you sweet? You see, she had a sister named Depression and a cousin named Alcohol, and oh, someone sneaked in Grammy. And her name, she is so old, but her name was Suicide. For the first time in my life, I was in the darkest place in my life, and I realized that this is something that I cannot handle. There are mental health facilities all throughout our country, and I encourage any young man who connects with this story to understand that there is help. Because if you are ever fooled by these ladies, you can definitely become too comfortable in your bed. You see, there's a trigger for me. The trigger is... I just want to sleep. When I was asleep, I could control all variables. All the incidents that were happening outside of my life no longer exist. If I could, I could go from a beach to a hotel, a hotel to Hawaii, I was able to control everything in my sleep that I couldn't in my reality because I wasn't willing to deal with it. Understanding this, depression became my friend because when I woke up, I instantly cried. And I thought to myself, I just want to sleep. And that's when Grammy said, son, come here, let me show you something. It was only when I walked into the street for the first time, only being avoided by my father's voice in my head saying, come inside, it's your birthday celebration, that I realized I had a problem and I called for help. And at that point, I went deep into myself and I asked the true question of what is going on. As I called a counseling professional, I would understand that the greatest advice ever is about to happen in that she said to me, the same thing I'm telling you. Focus on the things you loved as a child. The one thing I can remember, no matter where I was in my life, is I loved to draw. I drew on walls, I got suspended, got detention, drew in the back of my book. I actually applied to St. Augustine's College and drew Dragon Ball Z on the back and didn't finish my math exam. To this day, I don't know how they let me in. But the point is, I love to draw, and that's the one thing that brought me joy. So I started to draw again and again. And then I started to sell it for $5, and then for $10, and then for $20. And soon enough, I realized that there was a correlation between the bottles on my floor and the amount of money I was making. <laughs> I was like, hey, I'm actually making money from this drawing thing. The thing that many people say that you don't make money from is at this point that I gave you the first hint to understanding how much you must trust the process. You will experience hurdles in life. I will not lie to you. You will experience hurdles in life. Hurdles are put there either by yourself, by others, but in this case, it was put there because of my choices. The hurdle I had to get over was me. What is my purpose? Where do I want to go next? What do I want to pursue? And that hurdle, once I confronted that hurdle and found out that, hey, this is even, this is even a hurdle I have to jump over. This is a hurdle that I put here. Literally, I just kicked it over and realized that I could change me. You have to redefine yourself if you're going to step into a new pathway. So in rebranding myself, I became known in society as the artist known as Wayne Head. I decided to go off, study, compete. And I realized through the humbling experience of competing internationally that when I started to want to be depressed, I couldn't because now I was starting to impress. I started to impress my friends, impress my followers, and most of all, impress myself. The second thing I had to realize in order to get myself out of that hole, a skill that I think is needed, especially as we come out of the slums of COVID-19, is that I'm not alone, and neither are you. We need to understand that the sisters may come, but there's something called mentorship. Mentorship. I'll say it again. Mentorship. 
One word of advice I give every young man is to seek a male figure that you can look to for guidance. One that's spiritual, one that's advanced in the area that you want to pursue, and especially one that's not going to just tell you what you want to hear, but tell you what you need to know. Once I found mentors, I found it harder to find myself in depression. My mentors couldn't allow me. They would tell me, hey, you're just going on that road again. Take a left, take a right. They would direct my path. But most of all, they would just give me the honest truth. They would tell me when I'm repeating habits that I've overcome. You see, now that I've redefined myself in branding and I've sought a mentorship, now was the final process that it took to find purpose, which is understanding that purpose literally is not a destination. The ultimate destination of purpose, I believe, is heaven. It's fine you know that you're before the creator of all things, and he says, well done. I believe that is purpose. Up until that point, I can say with great confidence, you get a sense of it. You get sniffs of it here and there. Because if your purpose was only in this example to get a degree, then what's next after the degree? That's not a purpose. That's a goal. See, your purpose involves others. What does your talent, what does your gift do for others? That's the secret to finding out what is purpose. I leave you with a final thoughts. I want you to always remember this. At this age that you are right now, young man, it's okay to not know what you want to be. You're still developing. You're still going to have struggles and identity crisis, and people are still going to judge you and not understand. But I can tell you, and so can other men who can be great mentors, can tell you, we have all been on that road. We have all had the opportunity to juggle between what do I want to do? Do I want to pursue my career? Do I want to pursue this artistic talent, which at the beginning could have no money? Or do I want to pursue my education? Each one of them, you're confronted by a reality that I want to share right now, which you have to fight against. That reality is a scenario that's set in place unconsciously beyond your control. That is the scenario. If I will find a girlfriend, I will get a car, perhaps a Honda, get a room, an apartment complex. I will start a family. If, if I get married, that's good too. And after I get all these things and I have my children running around, then I shall have a nice sip of coconut water because my life is fulfilled. Young man, I'm here to share you that that is not often the path that's, that, that's trailed for leaders. If it was that simple, everybody would do it. You see, because you're confronted by distractions. You're confronted by the ladies that I mentioned. And finally, you're confronted by your own complications, that is your internal struggles. So above all, when you go on this path of life, do not be deterred by depression, expect it. And build up your resilience so that you know what to do when that time comes. Remember who you are, remember your key talents that you were given by God, and trust that what he gave you is sufficient to get you through it. It's, my, it's been my pleasure to present to you. My name is Rembert Mortimer, and I encourage you to keep listening every month as we continue on with these presentations. Having spent over a decade in the field of video, Stephen Hanna has made a name for himself in both his creative and commercial work. While the list of organizations that he has worked with is wide and varied, it is his work online producing educational and civic-minded video blogs that has brought him the most notoriety. Without further ado, our next Conclave speaker is none other than Mr. Stephen Hanna. Hey, welcome to my, welcome to my channel. <laughs> uh, it's not really my channel. So I've been asked to speak to you about finding your voice. And I thought to myself, how can I compile all my knowledge into a 10 minute presentation? Then, then I realized what this was all about. This is about this. What is that? Well, I'll give you a hint. It is common, it's delicious, it's a part of a complete breakfast. That's right, you guessed it. It's a dragon. What, you, you didn't see a dragon when you look at this? Don't, don't tell me you're one of those people that see an egg. I mean, how could you see an egg? Everyone knows that this is a dragon.
For centuries and centuries, people have seen dragons and acknowledged them as a critical part of both our economic and social structures, particularly in the Bahamas. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you again, what is this? Do you see a dragon now? Why would you say it's a dragon? You knew it was an egg the first time I showed it to you. There was zero doubt in your mind that it was an egg. There was no possibility that this could be a dragon because it's not. But you let me put that doubt in your mind that maybe, maybe you were wrong. Maybe you don't know what a dragon looks like. Maybe you don't know what an egg looks like. Maybe you thought that I wanted you to say dragon, even though that is clearly the wrong answer. Now, this may all seem silly, but it happens all the time where people let other people convince them that their egg is a dragon. Now, what do I mean? Sometimes you have a, a really good idea and you want to do something and someone says to you, you can't because that thing that you have in your head with all that potential that will change the world, they, they tell you that it's dangerous or destructive or worse. It's a fantasy, a fairy tale that for you to think like that, it's all make-believe. Then they look you in your eye and tell you that your egg is nothing more than a dragon. And nothing will come of it because dragons don't exist. And they'll, they'll give you a thousand reasons why it won't work. You're short, you're a girl, you're black, you're poor, you're not a good singer. No one makes money drawing pictures. And, and they tell you all these superficial things, but they don't know you. In their mind, they don't see the egg. All they see is the insurmountable circumstances preventing you from reaching your goal. To them, you cannot. But you've always known the truth. I mean, it wouldn't be in your heart to want those big dreams if you were incapable of achieving them. Sure, it will be hard for some of your dreams. But deep down inside, you can do it. You know you can do it. You know who you are. So don't wait for anyone to tell you that you're good at what you're doing or that you're good at what you want to do. If, if you wait for everyone to love you, you'll be dead before you do anything. I mean, plan, but don't hesitate. Just go out there and change the world. And you might not know how to. So go ahead. Ask somebody. How can... You change the world with your two streams on SoundCloud. Hmm? And when they tell you that you can't, and it is inevitable that someone will tell you that you can't or it doesn't work, just nod your head and say, oh, okay. Don't argue with them. Don't try to sway them with words. Just know you asked the wrong person. You can always change the world. You're changing the world right now by existing and you will change it if you cease to exist. The key is to find a way with whatever ability that you have to change the world for the better, however large or however small, but you cannot wait. Do not wait until you have a nice pair of shoes. Don't wait until you have the, the newest camera. Don't wait for anyone to tell you that you're doing a good job. Don't wait until you're ready. You need to start now because the only way for you to find your voice is to speak. And if you want people to listen to you, I mean like really listen to you, you got to listen to yourself. There are problems that I have not even articulated for myself yet. And you probably have the solution because every new generation has the solution to solve the previous generation's problems. During my grandparents' time, people died from undercooked food, which is probably why my parents overcook everything. No, you don't need to boil Fruit Loops. 
The whole point is, we are probably going to leave you a planet filled with problems to figure out. And while I can tell you that the world should not be this hot, aside from eating the rich, I don't have a lot of specific tips and tricks to give you. I mean, besides make sure that it's it's cooked thoroughly through and, and comes up to 60 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. You have to find and listen to your voice because the future of the human race depends on your egg. So, what is it that you have to say? Anthony Sturr was born on November 19, 1992. He works as a sale associate for Lightburn Trading and is also the owner of the Cake Guy Bakery. Currently a student at the University of the Bahamas, Anthony studies secondary education with a concentration in family and consumer sciences. Currently in his junior year, he serves as the reigning Mr. University of the Bahamas 2021. Anthony also has a passion for theater and writing and can be seen in yearly Shakespeare in Paradise Productions and the UB Theater Company. He is an advocate of bullying, working to eradicate bullying from all schools around the Bahamas. Please help me welcome our keynote speaker for this evening, celebrating his 29th birthday, Mr. Anthony Sturr. Good evening once again to all of our esteemed guests, or those who are watching from their homes as well. Happy International Men's Day. My name is Anthony Sturb and I am the reigning Mr. University of the Bahamas. <sighs> Lazy, stupid, not talented, dumb, ugly, hideous, weird, fat, friendless, loser. Those were a few words that I was told every day growing up. Now the topic I'm here to talk about today is surviving bullying as a man. Now my journey, it was filled with a lot of twists and turns, a lot of heartbreak, a lot of disappointment, but most importantly, a lot of resilience. It all started when my mother died from stage four breast cancer when I was a child. Now, we all know that a bohemian male biggest cheerleader would have to be his mother, of course. And not having that in my life, it seemed weird at first because, you know, your best friend is no longer there. So it was a lot of readjustment. Not having someone who was so important in my life and who was so beneficial, someone who I lived with, seeing that person every day is no longer there. Having your whole life abrupted and having to change homes, having to change um, every environment that you're in. And you're doing all that on top of starting in junior high. Uh, when I first started junior high, uh, my grandmother decided to put me into private school. Uh, of course, I was away from all of my friends who I was with from grade one. But nonetheless, I was excited about the journey. Uh, upon reaching junior high, I was bullied immediately. Uh, I was told that my family wasn't rich enough, and I was teased every day about being poor. So every lunchtime, I would be seen sitting by myself, constantly being bullied, constantly being harassed, constantly being hit, and the fact that nobody did anything. I think that hurt the most. I can remember a lot of the practical jokes turn into laughter, a lot of laughter turn into hidden and a lot of hidden turn into abuse. You know, I always said that children could be cruel and it actually did took a toll on my mental health. Um, I was always an honor student and when arriving at junior high, my GPA dropped from a high 3.2 to a 0 0.78. Uh, my grandparents wasn't pleased about that. And the fact that I said that not one teacher even cared enough to see 
what was going on or to see what was happening with me. I got so depressed to the point that I started taking antidepressants uh, just at 12 years old. Uh, I got so depressed that I turned to painkillers and other drugs to try to numb the pain. It led to the point where I had to go to rehab as a child. And do you know what it is at 12 years old to go to rehab and to be in an environment where you have to talk about an addiction and that's just happening so abruptly and all of that took a toll on my mental health. <sighs> Upon completing rehab, I decided to go back to school. Of course, nobody noticed that I was missing out, I was gone. No teacher asked what happened. They just pretend like I was gone for a day. My grandmother wanted me to have a fresh start after my first year in grade seven. She wanted me to move to Freeport and go to Grand Bahama. And I thought it was a good decision at the time. Uh, upon going there, uh, I was sent to live with my uncle and my aunt. Uh, and of course, that didn't turn out well either. <laughs> and I was sent back home to Nassau quickly. After that, I had a few more run-ins and a few more depressions as well. When I reached in high school, uh, I finally was able to go back and to be with all my friends who I knew from primary school. And shockingly, they all changed. A lot of them were in gangs. A lot of them uh, excelled to excellence. And some were just the biggest bullies we've ever seen. But through all this, I was determined to reach my goal. And that goal was to no longer change schools every year, to stay at a school until graduation, and to get my high school diploma. That was something that I wanted to do, not for anybody else, but for myself. So I allowed myself to be bullied. I allowed the hurtful comments that persons would say to get to me. I remember in high school, we had the choice to pick our own option. They gave us three choices to pick, and we would be able to get into one of those choices. Uh, my first choice was business. <laughs> My second choice was family and consumer science, and my third choice was electrical engineer. And I didn't get into any one of those choices because I was told that I was too dumb to be in those programs. So they shoved me into the music program. And everybody knew at the time, music and art, uh, it had most of the quote unquote bad students inside of it. So. Every day going inside the music room, I would be really depressed, uh, being bullied, being tortured, being abused, having no teacher or no adult supervision saying, hey, you know, you can't do that to someone or that's not right what you're doing. But of course, everyone turned a blind eye because it was me. And they think that I should just tolerate it. So I allowed it to happen and the bullying just got worse and worse. But you know, I took it and I tried to push forth and to push on, no matter how mean it persons might get. Because I said, you know, God put me there for a reason. And I may not know what that reason was at the time, but it had to be a reason. I can remember one day in class, we were watching a movie. And I remember saying out loud that, you know, one of these days, I actually want to be famous. And I remember the whole entire class laughing at me, and they thought that was funny. And they said that, I would never be famous and I would never be anything in life because I was hideous and I was fat. <sighs> so it really got to me because, you know, sometimes laughing, it really did get loud. And, you know, my dreams, it just kept getting crushed and crushed and crushed. Um, I can remember working so hard in high school, but the highest my GPA would ever be was uh, 250 because I remember a lot of times teachers would constantly lose my work uh, because they just didn't care. Uh, these, this is one of the perks of going to a government school at the time, uh, back in my day. <laughs> so they didn't care enough to check on my work that I would give them or assignments I would turn in on time. Uh, sometimes other students would take my assignment and turn it in with my name on it and it scotched off. And once again, no teacher would care. So I felt like, you know, this is just not going my way. But nonetheless, I kept pushing on until I reached my senior year. You know, 
I might have not been an honor student in high school, but things were starting to look up because I have to now start thinking about life after high school. And what was Anthony now going to do? I didn't know what I wanted to do at the time. I said I wanted to be a journalist, I wanted to be a lawyer, but I never really felt passionate about any of those things. So, nonetheless, I always did know that I wanted to go to college at the Bahamas at the time. I remember filling out the application form. Uh, I did not know PJCs, I know PJCSEs, and I was, take, I was taking my PJCSEs that year. But through the faith of God, I said, no, I'm still gonna fill it out, I'm gonna apply, and whatever happens, happens. I remember graduating high school, um, failing all my PGCSEs and not getting into college. <laughs> I decided that I was going to get a job at Wendy's. I worked there for about five months. Uh, that was depressing, going to work every day, being bullied and harassed, uh, being called a lot of names and being taken advantage of uh, because I was 17 at the time and I didn't have proper education, I didn't have any qualifications. so. I had no choice but to put up with what people would say to me. But you know, at one point in time, I said, you know, this isn't what I want. I have to want better for my life. So what am I gonna do about it? So I decided to quit my job and I enrolled in Bahamas Baptist College. I enrolled in a preparatory program and I made it for about one semester until I dropped out because I couldn't afford the school fee. Then I got a job at a gas station at pumping gas. I stayed there for about four more years, receiving more abuse as well. And you know, I say, Anthony, this isn't what you want. You have to want better for yourself. You have to keep pushing. And once again, I quit my job again. And at this point, I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't know where I'm gonna go, how I'm gonna have a source of income, but I know that I'll just have to pray about it and God's gonna find a way to bring me to the goal that I want. And the goal is I, that I want is to go to college. I remember messaging one of my friends uh, about college at the Bahamas at the time. Uh, and my friend replied to me that I wasn't smart enough to go there. What I should do is go to BPDI and take up a trade and learn how to do plumbing or something. Don't come to that school. So that comment kind of hurt me because that comment coming from a friend, I was like, wow, nobody actually believes in me. Nobody's taking the time to say, hey, you know, you got this. You just have to believe in yourself and you just got to push forward. So nonetheless, I decided to get a new job at Library and Trading. Uh, and I say, no, maybe I'm going to stay here for the rest of my life because uh, education is now out of the way. I'm not going to go anywhere. So this place doesn't seem so bad. I guess I could work my way up. So two promotions later, I found out that I really wasn't happy there. Uh, I love the job, I love the persons there, but that's not what I'm passionate about. That's not what I was put on this earth to do. Uh, I remember being so depressed that my general manager, he, he actually saw through it, and he pulled me in the office one day and he said, you know, Anthony, um, in life, you know, you have to find what you're passionate about. And I see that you're not passionate about this job. I see that you don't like working here. And it's not a bad thing. He said that he loves working here and that's why he's so able to be passionate every morning to get up and to push forth and he loves doing what he do for his job. He said you can't find a job, you have to find instead a career, a career that you're passionate about. Whatever that may be, you have to go and you have to find it. Now keep in mind, I thought I was going to get fired. <laughs> but he said, no, you're not going to get fired, you're going to keep your job. But just try to take the time, you're young. Go out and find what makes you happy. So I took his advice, and I remember redoing my BGCSEs, going to night school while working, and I remember passing on my BGCSEs. So I say, no things are looking a little brighter for me. So I started filling out government job applications because I say, you know, it's time for me to get a more stable job. And I remember the person calling me. And I did the physical, did the medical, did the interviews, did the psychology test, passed everything, and got my letter to go in. And I'm looking at this letter on my phone, and I say, you know, I can't do it. I just can't do it. I cannot work there. It's not a bad place, but it's just not a place for me to work. And a lot of persons were mad at me because I turned down a government job. 
but that's not a government job that I want. So I say, you know, I start having anxiety problems and I started panicking because I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. Where was my life going to go? Um, so I just decided to now go and get involved in theater. I found this acting company called Shakespeare in Paradise. Uh, at the time, I wasn't a good singer, but I decided to try out for the musical anyway. <laughs> and God knows what I did that for. I made a complete fool of myself on stage. But nonetheless, I saw they had another audition, and I tried out for that. And I don't know what Dr. Nicola Pfeffer saw in me, but she must have saw something where she gave me a chance to get the part. It wasn't a big part, but it's a part. And I see notice my foot in the door. So I did that for a year, came back another year, did it again with a bigger part. Um, and I remember back being backstage, uh, a few of the persons who were in the cast and crew, uh, they were really supportive. And a lot of them were students at the University of the Bahamas. And a few of them were professors as well. And they was uh, asking me, do I go to school? And I told them, no. So they said, you know, you should try to join University of the Bahamas in Try and roll. I say, I don't think I'm good enough to be in that. They say, yeah, you are. I say, you might never know. You might like it. So I say, you know what? This will be the last time I'm going to try uh, this college thing. And if it doesn't work, I don't know what's going to happen. So I filled the application for the last time. Dropped it off. And I got my acceptance letter and got accepted. Now, I didn't know how I was going to pay for college. And... Uh, college is starting in about six weeks. So I saved up as much money as I could to start for spring 2019. I say, you know, only two or three classes. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to college. And that's what I did. And with those two and three classes, my first semester, I made a 4.0. Then I say, you know, uh, I saw this competition, Mr. University of Bahamas. I couldn't do it at the time because I was a first, fresh, first semester freshman. So I say, no, I'm going to try it again next year. Uh, but I say, no, I have to be a full-time student. So I say, no, I have to start saving money. Then I noticed that this government grant program came around. I say, OK, just sign up for this. I signed up, got on. Then I saw the teacher stipend. I say, no, that's something else. And I signed up and got on that as well. My second semester, 375. Then I moved on to a year later, my spring semester. My first competition competing in Mr. University of the Bahamas. Uh, I had anxiety problems and I was terrified of speaking in front of persons. But nonetheless, I tried out, signed up, and was ready to go. And a lot of persons know, but that training is really intense. <laughs> and I met a lot of good persons throughout that process, uh, like Denavio. And I got first run off. I was a little devastated. Uh, because I felt like I didn't try hard enough. And someone did stop me after the competition and said, you know, you should try again. I said, I don't think so. I said, you know, I lost the first time. This isn't time for me to try again. I should just focus on school. And he said, no, try again. I'm going to help you. And that person did help me. And they pushed me through for the entire year. And I tried again for the final time. And in that time, when I tried, I pushed, I pushed, and pushed. And I stand here before you as Mr. University of the Bahamas. Being that student, and looking back now, that student who was suicidal, who was getting ready to give up their life, who had no future, who persons thought had no future. I can remember failing BGCSEs and persons on the phone laughing at it, persons mocking me for not being smart enough, persons laughing at my dreams and my ambition. You know, sometimes life, it is dark, it is twisted, and it's not always going to go your way. It's full of twists and turns and obstacles that you have to overcome. But there's always going to be a light at every dark tunnel. It's up to you to decide whether or not you want to push through that light. We have to start teaching our young men to not bully others, but instead uplift one another, push one another to do greatness and to be the best version of ourselves. And I honestly can say, if I can do it, Anybody could do it. So thank you. Certainly, the University of the Bahamas has been a hallmark of excellence in producing some of the finest men of quality standard here in our country. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of tonight's program, and it would be remiss of me if I did not recognize our dynamic speakers for tonight. A special thank you to Mr. Ahmad Thompson, Mr. Derek Smith, Mr. Renwood Mortimer, and our Mr. University of the Bahamas, Mr. Anthony Stern. On behalf of our president, Dr. Rodney D. Smith, the administration, faculty, and staff of the University of the Bahamas, my name is Denavi O'Neilly, and it's been a pleasure.